He's the commissioner of Major League Baseball, Mr. Commissioner to you, or Rob, Rob Manfred, the uh, baseball commissioner, the 10th commissioner of uh, Major League Baseball. Thank you for joining us, Commissioner. Glad to be here. So can I call you Rob? You can. Okay, because I, I don't want to go you know <laughs> off script here and then somebody saying, you're disrespecting the commissioner's office. You said it once. Okay, right? that's they, it. They, 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 you're good now. But okay. you want my guys to call you Mr. Commissioner. They can call me, they can call me whatever they <laughs> yeah. want. It doesn't matter to me. Does your wife call you commissioner? No, <laughs> no. She does not. <laughs> Some other do things. You call, but, do you yeah. call her commissioner? No. no. <laughs> do you get that, hey, uh, clean out the garage, yeah, commissioner? just like everybody else. <laughs> All right. How many times did it take you to get that signature on Major League, your, the Major League Baseball? Well, you know, it, it actually was a funny thing. Um, the day after I got elected, I, I went to the office, and um, the person who was running our licensing department came down. He had a whole stack of index cards and about 10 pens. And he said, you need to figure out, you know, you need to sign a whole bunch of times and decide which one of these um, is going to be the signature that goes on the ball. Because I got elected in August. They needed to start making baseballs for the following um, season. Uh, interestingly, I approached it from the perspective of replicability, right? Can I do it again? <laughs> um, yeah. you know, or do it again standing up <laughs> on a round surface. And um, so that's where we ended up. <laughs> Uh, could you sign the baseball yeah. that do do people ask you to sign the oh. baseball that has your signature already on it all the time? But yeah. but you've already signed it. I, I know. I, 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 can I, you uh, let's see if you can replicate that. So there's a technique here. Did you know this? No, I learned this from Joe Torrey. You know, it's hard to just hold it out there and write on it. So you kind of put it against your leg. OK, so that it's stationary. All right. And, you know, Joe has one of the best. He does great, have great penmanship. Yeah, I think it was that Catholic school education. There you go. All right. Let me see. Let me see if I can turn it around. How'd I do? Paulie, put that on eBay right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we're going to get for that, but let's, uh, let, let's put it out there. There is a market on eBay, by the way. If you, Siri, all kidding aside, you know, like everybody, your signature has a market. Uh, mine's not that what you, impressive. What are you going for? <laughs> I don't know, but it's not that impressive. <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, how often do you talk to other commissioners in other sports? Um, we get together as a group a few times a year, the four major sports, and, you know, one-offs probably, you know, once, twice a month. Um, you know, we, we had a deeper relationship with the NHL because of the um, media rights deal that we did with them, so I talked to Gary Moore. Um, but I talk to all of them, you know, once every couple of months. We're talking a lot now, um, mostly about g gambling. Gambling? Yeah. Okay, yeah. where do we stand with gambling? Like how do, it feels like everybody wants to get their piece, and then once they get their piece, we've settled that, and right. then, then all of a sudden we have gambling. Well, the way I think about it is this. You know, it's a challenge and an opportunity, right? Uh, on the challenge side... Um, you know, there's been a lot written about, you know, us lobbying. And, and, but the fact of the matter is we talked to sports in Europe when we realized this was coming. Said the single biggest mistake you can make is not being active in trying to determine what the legal framework is going to look like from an integrity perspective. We need laws, whether they're state laws, federal laws, whatever, that allow us to protect the integrity of our sport. That's our job. Um, we're not going to delegate it to some regulator in New Jersey or whatever. With all due respect, you know, we care more about it. It's what we're about. On the other hand, it's an opportunity. We, we know, you know, just you don't even need research, but there is research. Fan engagement can be improved through gaming. People are more interested in the sport. They consume more of the sport. Um, so you, you want to take um, advantage of that opportunity without letting gaming become too intrusive. You know, gaming can go over the top. You kind of saw it in the DraftKings FanDuel advertising wars, right? That's an example of it. And so we, we want to find that sweet spot where fans consume more of our game uh, without the gaming becoming overwhelming. Could you see where I go to the ballpark and I can place a bet there? Well, you know, that is the easiest answer in gaming, because all this gaming is going to be mobile. Yes. And so once you know that, you don't have to answer questions about are there going to be kiosks or windows or any of those things. The fact of the matter is you're going to be able to do it on your phone, and you can't stop that whether you're in the ballpark or out of the ballpark. But 
you can capitalize on it as the commissioner and your owners can capitalize on this look, and having, you know, something like a room where you can go in and place a bet. Look, there is no question that gaming presents an economic opportunity for us. I don't think um, we see it as an engagement sale of, you know, intellectual property like statistics opportunity. We will not be directly in the gaming business. When people try to connect Pete Rose to gambling. Easy, right? I mean, I think it's actually another easy question that you get asked all the time. No matter what happens with gambling in the United States, there will always be a rule that prohibits on-field personnel, managers, coaches, players, front office personnel from betting on the sport. It feels like I was told by somebody that I trust that there's, there's still more to Pete's story that has never come out and maybe it'll never come out. That's a Pete Rose question. You know, I, I just don't know. No, I but mean, I, this is evidence that baseball has. Oh, um, I, I would say this. Um, I, I've never found it necessary in any, without singling out Pete, in any disciplinary matter to write down everything you know about what's going on. I, I just don't think it's usually productive. Any chance uh, for a baseball team in Vegas? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think Vegas is a viable um, expansion alternative. I think it's big enough. Um, but once you get your stadiums with Tampa and Oakland done, mm -hmm. are we looking at expanding then after that? Yeah, uh, and you, you hit it just right, Dan. I mean, you, Oakland and Tampa have to get done before anything else happens. Um, I would then like to get to 32. I'd like to get to 32. Um, it gives you schedule flexibility because fours work better than fives in the schedule, just in terms of being able to lay the games out. It also presents an opportunity. So you, you do eight divisions with yeah, four teams? That's what I would do. But, okay. you know, I mean, that's a, an issue that would have to be discussed. But whether it's eights or fours, you still get that schedule flexibility. Um, it creates a possibility of some realignment that could help in terms of travel. And maybe best of all, it gives you a lot of flexibility in what you would do with your playoff format. you got a lot more options on your playoff format. And where are we looking at with possibilities here? Oh, you know, we're lucky in this regard. And I mean, it is an embarrassment of riches. Whenever you talk about cities, you know, if you leave one off or mention one, you know, that gets that city all, you know, one direction or the other. Um, but, you, you know, in the U.S., you could Vegas, Portland, Nashville, Charlotte, all viable alternatives for us. Uh, Montreal, certainly, maybe someplace else in Canada. I, I think, you know, Mexico, depending on how far down the road we are, could be another possibility for us. As a franchise in yeah. Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, Red Sox-Yankees next year in London? Next year in London. Uh, really excited about that. Um, I, I, you know, I get, I'll tell you two things about um, that that have already happened that are indicative of what this event could be. First of all, both owners, Hal Steinbrenner and John Henry, flew to London to do the press conference with me. That's how excited the clubs are about this. This is an unusual thing, you know. It, they, they, they don't usually um, do that kind of travel. Secondly, in the first, call me a liar, 24 hours, I believe, we had 57,000 pre-registers for a 55,000-seat stadium. So... Um, you know, we think it's going to be a really big event. We hope it gives us a foothold in Europe. Um, and, you know, it, w when you want to make a splash, you take your biggest rival. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. He's the commissioner of Major League Baseball, Rob Manfred, joining us here in the Man Cave. Um, baseball shifts. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw where Bryce Harper the other day in New York thought he had a base hit, uh, ended up hitting into a double play and frustrated, didn't run out the uh, ball. Right. You know, we've seen these shifts now. Is there anything the commissioner can do, wants to do, will do with these baseball shifts? Well, I, I think it's a broader issue than shifts. Um, the, the, the way that I think about it is this, Dan. You know, the new thinking in the game, the use of analytics have produced organic change in the game. Um, and I think that it is pretty clear um, that the owners want to have a conversation about whether we need to be more proactive in terms of rule changes in managing what is happening organically. So um, shifts, just one example, I don't mean to single that out. There are other issues out there, but, you know, is it time? Um, we understand why people are doing it. We understand that, you know, it provides an advantage. But is it time that we adopt a rule that limits the use of them? I mean, it, it has been a, you know, just an astounding change. I think in less than 10 years, we've gone from 
2,400 pitches a year where you see a shift to over 36,000 this year. But how could you limit it? Well, you, you'd limit it by, I mean, the easiest way, been a bunch of suggestions, you know, two defenders each side of the second base bag, maybe make sure that the infielders all have to have at least one foot on the dirt. There's a variety of things that you could do. Maybe a dog fence where there's only so far they could go and then they, then they get jolted. Is that? Yeah. I, I mean, look, you, you, you don't want to be, you don't want to be intrusive. Um, you don't want to be in a position where you're changing what we regard to be the greatest game in the world with or without the issues surrounding shifts and other things. We think it's a great game on the field. Um, by the same token, you know, it has changed, and it's important. I think it's incumbent upon us to talk about that change and decide, you know, if and when it's appropriate to interfere. What other rule changes do you th see on the horizon? Well, I, you know, the things that people are talking about, and, and that's different than do I foresee a change. Um, you know, I think the other one that people talk a, a lot about is the use of relief pitchers. Um, and it does have a lot of effects, right? If starters go a shorter period of time. That affects the way they pitch during that shorter period of time, right? All-out effort. Um, it, it, frankly, it affects the marketing of the game, right? The p individual player most prevalent in a broadcast is a starting pitcher. If he's out there less, that changes, you know, the star power of that individual pitcher. So you have to think about all those issues. And then the, the toughest one, toughest one when you change a rule in baseball is to figure out what the rule change is going to do. What's the effect of that change? So take shifts, right? Assume, you know, that was a huge change. People start shifting a lot. What everybody said, you know, you go back and look is, oh, this is not a big deal, right? Because the hitter is just going to go the other way. The hitters are going to adjust. They're yeah. great athletes. And they're, they'll just go the other way. Well, they were right about two parts. The hitters will adjust. They are great athletes. But the adjustment was different than what everybody expected. Yeah. Instead of going the other way, they decided to go up and over. And why'd they do that? Because what the analytics told them is even the discounted opportunity to get a home run, okay, you don't doesn't happen as frequently, is more valuable than that hit going the other way in terms of actually winning a game. So you got to think through what's going to happen. And, and, you know, I got great – we were talking about this before we came on the air, you know. When you don't, when you haven't played at that level, you have to have um, players, former players, former managers with major league experience around you to help you try to think through what is a really unpredictable outcome. The DH. If I said you had, you could, you could make the decision right now. Yeah, I'd leave. I'd leave it alone. You don't want it in the National League? No, I, the reason I want to leave it alone is it gives everybody who interviews me something to ask about that's <laughs> relatively easy to deal with. I mean, <laughs> you like the team? I mean, I just it uh, yeah, for you. yeah, it's easy. Um, no, I, uh, that's that's really not the truth. The truth is, it feels like it's coming. Uh, well, I, you know, I don't really agree with that. I, I, I think that. But you would know better than I. But I just it it felt like it was coming because there's more offense. Yeah, I, but if you look at the two leagues, I don't think people see the DH. Uh, it, to the extent that we have an issue with offense, if that's your issue, I, I, if you look at the two leagues, I'm not sure that you would reach the conclusion that the DH is your answer. And I can keep stars in. They can be around longer, there's value, too. Look, there's value in that. Although, you know, the DH has changed a little bit, right? I mean, you know, years ago, the Dave Winfields, the Don Baylors, we kept those All veteran monitor. guys around. <laughs> they're different kinds of players now. If you look at who the teams are using as their DHs, it's, it's a little different um, than it was. I, I think that it's a good thing for the game to have that debate, number one. Number two, you know, extinction is a bad word, right? I mean, it's just sort of a word you want to stay away Sounds from. Sounds final. It's harsh, you yeah. know, there's yeah. something about it. Yeah. And, you know, if the National League drops the DH, that form of baseball becomes extinct. Or it adopts adopts it. Yeah, I said drops. I meant adopts. But if they adopt it, you know, the, the pure form of baseball that's played in the National League becomes extinct. And, I, I you know, I think there would be some reluctance. How are you capturing the youth? Uh, I know I know this is a big initiative for you, but this this group, this generation, or these parents who are listening, how are you attracting those kids? You know, I think it, th this is really interesting. Um, we thought getting kids to play – was going to be really hard. 
And uh, what we have found is that investment will, in fact, draw kids to the game. So what's that investment look like? It's all under the umbrella of play ball. It's everything from one-day events that the Conference of Mayors run with us where you try to introduce people to the game with, you know, drills and quick interaction and then a description of playing opportunities. Where can you play Little League? Where can you play if you're 14 years old? Where are the opportunities? Everything from that up to the MLB academies where we are providing elite-level training in underserved areas, um, places where there just weren't fields and coaches to get kids to play. We have a safe game that provides tremendous playing opportunities, that teaches great values, and we, we've had a tremendous uh, amount of success. You know, the biggest problem in sports to me, uh, and it really is a societal problem, is that overall youth participation in sports, and I'm not talking about baseball, all sports, is declining. It's declining because of the interest in technology and electronics. Over the last three years, um, and these are not our numbers, these are industry association numbers, only one major sport has grown in participation over the last three years, and this includes soccer, lacrosse, all the things people talk about, and it's baseball. Um, we've grown at an average annual rate of 6% over the last three years in the face of declining participation. Baseball is still the most played sport by children under 12 in the United States. Um, and, you know, the trick, the trick is being where kids are and being willing to put money out there um, to provide them with playing opportunities. How do you respond when somebody says the most popular or the best player in the sport, the only publicity he gets is the publicity that he's not getting publicity, and that's Mike Trout? You know, it's interesting. I, I actually read about... This topic, um, uh, Bill Shaken had an article um, this morning in the L.A. papers. Um, it, you know, publicity, player marketing, um, and I, I've said this to players, so I don't mind saying it here. You know, uh, player marketing is an important function, but in order to do it, what do you need? A player. Yeah. And I think if you read Bill's article, you know, there's a, uh, it's really thoughtful, and one of the points he makes is, you know, Mike, Mike has made certain decisions about how he wants to play and what he wants to do with the rest of his life. And, and that affects the profile that you're going to have. If you want to be the most famous player, as well as being probably the best, there are certain things that you have to devote time to. And, you know, that, that's a lifestyle choice for players. Um, having said that, I do think it's really important for the sport broadly defined to market its players. The game is about the players. Um, I, I think that the way you build your brand and you build your uh, fame in today's world has changed. Um, it's not enough to be the best on the field. You have to be prepared to give fans social media. that access via yeah. social media. Um, and, you know, it's something that uh, we're going to make a genuine effort to try to be of assistance to our players on. Favorite baseball player growing up? Mickey Mantle. Um, you know, I, I, I was really, you know, sometimes you think back on your life and you think, well, maybe this was meant to be. So my folks, drove, I grew up in upstate New York. My folks drove my sister and my brother um, down to New York for a weekend of baseball. My dad was a huge Yankee fan. Um, it's, 19, it's August of 1968, right? So Mantle's at the end. That's of it, the, yeah. Right? But we've been, I've been watching them because they had cable, you know, in upstate New York, you had cable early because of the whole Syracuse University thing. You know, you they, they experimented with cable in the valleys in upstate oh, I didn't New York. Know oh, yeah, yeah. That is actually a historical fact, believe it or not. Um, anyway, that so. That was the Yes Network before the Yes yeah, Network. Right. There was cable before there was really cable. <laughs> Anyways, um, so we go down, and the first day they're playing the Twins, and they lose to the Twins three to two, but Mantle hits a home run from each side of the plate. They scored two runs. He had two solo shots. Turns out it was the last time he ever did it. Um, so pretty, you know, pretty amazing first baseball, live baseball experience, if you think about Do it. Do you got memorabilia? You know, I, this is funny. Um, I, I did a little um, event with President Bush after I was elected, and he, this was the last question he asked me. He was asking me questions in front of an audience. And I said, you know, if, if I answer this, everybody's going to think I made this up, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I, I was in the stadium the night after 9-11 when he threw out the first pitch. Yeah. 
and he signed a dozen baseballs. And I ended up with one of those baseballs. And it, of all the things I've been given over the years, it's the only thing I've ever kept. That's the only piece it's of memorabilia? It's the only thing I've ever kept. So if I go into your office, no other memorabilia in there? Yeah, no. There, yeah, well, I, I take that back. I, there, Bud signed a ball. Sealy signed a ball that I haven't that actually sits in my office. I take that back. You 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 asked a good question that proves I wasn't telling the truth. <laughs> Do you have the keys to the Hall of Fame? No. no. See, if you wanted to go there and just like Well, if I wanted to go there and ram around, um, Jane Clark is a really uh, wonderful woman. Um, I'm on the board. And there is, you know, they do do a back office tour okay. um, in the Hall of Fame that, you know, as phenomenal as the collection and the exhibits all are, it is literally mind-boggling what they have. I, I, the, the, they can't, you can't display it all at one time, yeah. but the, the collection itself. What I mean, would you grab if you, you, you can only grab one thing on the way out? You know what? I, you, this is going to be a funny answer. So I took my I, I took um, my kids there. Um, you, they're now in their you know late twenties and thirties um, when they were young, and my son was tremendously interested in golf, and um, they had on display the club championship trophy from, I think it's Leewood Country Club in Westchester County, the Babe Ruth one. I mean, I thought, what a great piece of memorabilia. There it is, right? I mean, what a great thing. It's great to see you, and uh, congrats with uh, the success with the youth programs around America, and uh, we appreciate your time as always. I'm glad to be here. Always happy to do it. He's the commissioner, Rob Manfred. For more Dan Patrick Show, tune to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV, or download the Dan Patrick Show app.